Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, Turkish colleagues, and good morning, U.S. participants. First of all, I want to thank organizing committee and particularly uh, Ramazan Idilman, the former president of Tazil, for organizing such a wonderful meeting and inviting us. My co-chairman, uh, Femi Tabak, cannot participate in the meeting. Her father has an urgent health problem. Uh, as far as I uh, learned, he has admitted to an ICU. He apologizes for not attending the meeting. Now, uh, another major subject in hepatology, uh, viral hepatitis. A some time ago, it was the only area of interest, you know, in hepatology. After the successful treatments of hepatitis C, and uh, because of the unchanged treatment options in hepatitis B, interest in viral hepatitis has decreased somewhat. However, viral hepatitis still remains an important health problem for the society, and they maintain their importance. In this session, we have two distinguished speakers. They will summarize the current data and knowledge about hepatitis B, Delta, and hepatitis C. After these speeches, five speakers will deal with the topic based on two cases. The first speaker is Prof. Jordan Feltz from University of Toronto, and uh, the second speaker is Dora Terra. University from University of uh, Southern California. Professor Jordan, uh, please take the microphone. Hello, my name is Jordan Feld from the Toronto Center for Liver Disease at the University of Toronto. And I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for their kind invitation to once again do the ASLD update uh, the debrief on hepatitis B and Delta HDV from the liver meeting that took place recently in 2021. And I'm only sorry that I can't be there to join you this year as we, as I was a couple of years ago when we had a wonderful time meeting together. So here are my disclosures. What I'll do today is go through first hepatitis B and talk about approved therapies with a specific focus on treatment withdrawal. There were some really key lessons that we learned at the meeting this year on that topic. And then I'll talk about hepatitis B cure and some of the progress that we've been making with antiviral strategies and immunomodulatory therapies. And then we'll move to hepatitis delta, specifically talking about bulovertide, the newly approved agent and some uh, exciting data there, as well as what we can look forward to in the future. Well, let's start by talking about stopping nucleotide analog therapy. We know that these uh, agents are safe and very effective, but unfortunately, they rarely lead to surface antigen loss. And there's been increasing interest in stopping these therapies and thinking about who can safely stop them. Why do we want to do this? Well, frankly, patients don't really want to take lifelong or very long-term therapy. And also there's been the increasing interest in using this as a therapeutic strategy where the idea of stopping therapy might actually lead to a reduction in surface antigen levels and potentially even increased surface antigen loss. And so one of the questions is, do you need actually a post-withdrawal flare to get surface antigen clearance? And if so, how can we try to achieve that in a safe manner? So there have been a number of studies done to date, some larger retrospective studies, some smaller prospective studies, and there were some nice data presented at the ASLB meeting. So we will be getting into this in a little more detail in the upcoming debate. Uh, you'll be hearing from myself and um, my esteemed colleague, although not quite as up for the challenge, I don't think, um, uh, Ray Kim from Stanford, and we'll be talking about uh, the possibility of stopping and whether you should or uh, stop or continue nucleotide analog therapy. But first, I'm going to talk about some abstracts that were presented at the meeting and give you a little tidbit of what's to come in the debate. So I'll start by talking about the Retract B uh, collaborative uh, effort, which you can see this is a, a study that is actually led out of our site in Toronto, uh, but is a collaboration across the globe of sites that have used cohort studies to look at nucleotide analog uh, withdrawal. And so in this cohort, 
uh, we put together a total of 945 patients uh, who had withdrawn therapy. And just to give you some key characteristics, the majority were Asian, even in the non-Asian centers. You can see that the median duration of nucleotide analog therapy prior to stopping was three years. Most were E-negative at the start of therapy, and you can see that although most guidelines don't recommend it, a little over 10% were cirrhotic prior to discontinuing therapy. And what was looked at here was outcomes beyond the first year of therapy. So the rationale here is we know that most people, if you stop therapy, you're going to see a bit of fluctuation in the HPV DNA in almost everyone. In some, you'll have a rise in ALT. And so the thought was perhaps you should look beyond one year. Let's ignore that first year of dynamic um, uh, changes after withdrawal and see what happens over the longer term and to look at sustained off-treatment remission and then look at specific types of relapse, virological relapse where the DNA gets above 2000 IU per ml, a biochemical relapse where the ALT is above 1.5 times the upper limit of normal, or a clinical relapse where you have both of these things occurring or alternatively the beneficial outcome of surface antigen loss, which was less of the focus in this study. So if we look at what happens beyond the first year, you can see this follow-up time starting at year one. And you can see that if you look at people who have a sustained remission or surface antigen loss in blue, or a sustained remission without surface antigen loss, so a little bit lower numbers in red, you can see that at two years, it's about 40%. And by four years, it's really dropping off that only 20% of patients have a sustained remission and only 30% have sustained remission or S antigen loss. And if you look at what happens in that first year of therapy, you can see a lot of patients had a relapse. In fact, two thirds had at least one episode of either virological or clinical relapse uh, during uh, that time period. And you can see that this, I'll show you in a moment, that this was predictive of future activity. Act of disease. So when we look at the factors associated with sustained remission with or without surface antigen loss, and you can see those shown in the two columns here, uh, um, either with or without surface antigen loss, what you see is that in general, it was more common to see sustained remission in Caucasian patients than in Asian patients, that if patients were uh, e antigen positive at the beginning of therapy, they had a higher probability of sustained remission. If they were surface antigen, I should point out that these patients all had to be e antigen negative by the time they stopped therapy. And if they had a surface antigen level that was below 100 IU per ml, they had a much higher chance of uh, surface antigen loss or sustained remission. And importantly, if they had activity in that first year, you can see that they were much less likely to achieve uh, sustained remission. You can see only 19% compared to 50% among those who had a quiet uh, first year off therapy. And if we look at this in a little more detail at the types of relapses that occurred, you can see that virologic relapse actually occurred uh, with an HPV DNA above 2000 in almost two thirds of the patients. And actually 44% of the patients had an HPV DNA above 20,000. So pretty high uh, virologic uh, rebound. And you can see that this was associated with biochemical relapse in many patients at different thresholds of ALT from 1.5 to two, or you can see that 16% actually have uh, flares of greater than five times the upper limit of normal. Uh, clinical relapse where both of these things occurred occurred in 41% of patients by the end of four years. And you can see that a third of patients needed retreatment, and this was at the discretion of the uh, treating provider. So if we look at the factors associated with sustained remission, this was associated with no relapse in the first year off therapy, being E antigen positive at the start of therapy, having a low baseline quantitative surface antigen, and being Caucasian as opposed to Asian. But in truth, it's important to recognize that only 30% of patients remained in sustained remission and only 13% of patients if they had active disease in the first year off treatment. So this really tells you that Although stopping therapy might be a reasonable thing to do, the majority of patients actually don't end up in a sustained remission or a clear surface antigen uh, with this approach in a pretty big study. And it's important to also recognize that relapse occurred with marked DNA elevations and at least sometimes marked ALT elevations. So these patients may actually have benefited from either earlier retreatment or possibly never stopping, as I'll make the case later in the debate. 
So this brings up another question about what do we need to actually get these beneficial outcomes? Do we actually need to have a post withdrawal flares to lead to surface antigen loss? And we were able to take a very good look at this using the hepatitis B research network data. Uh, this was a study in immune active patients who were randomized to receive either tenofovir alone or tenofovir um, with uh, PEG interferon for the first 24 weeks, followed by an additional three and a half years of tenofovir alone. So both groups received four years of therapy, either with six months of PEG interferon or tenofovir throughout. And in order, at the end of the four years of tenofovir therapy, uh, patients had to be antigen negative and anti-HBE positive, had to have an HBV DNA less than 1,000 IU per ml, could not have cirrhosis, and then if so, they could stop therapy. You can see this was uh, about 40 to 50 patients were eligible in both groups. And we were looking at surface antigen decline or loss, ALT elevations, and then whether or not they had active disease at the end of follow-up. So importantly in this study, because it was a prospective, carefully uh, followed group of patients, uh, we were really able to characterize things well. And importantly, we had protocolized retreatment criteria. Most of the studies that looking at withdrawal have left some wiggle room here. And so this allowed us to really look carefully at this. And one of the important things is when you look at what retreatment criteria we had, we wanted to allow patients to have pretty significant flares because one of the concerns is that if you stop too early, you might actually actually miss the benefit. If you put patients right back on retreatment, you might miss the benefit of uh, the of, of a, a significant flare. So you can see that the only time we allowed retreatment was patients that either had evidence of hepatic synthetic dysfunction or a clinical decompensation, or if they had quite significant flare. So an ALT above 1,000 with an HPV DNA above 10,000, or an HPV DNA above 10,000 with an ALT at 10 times the upper limit of normal on three occasions over four weeks, or times up five times the upper limit of normal on three occasions over 12 weeks. So you're really looking at sustained and high ALT elevations before we put patients back on treatment. And this really allows us to look carefully at the benefit of uh, these ALT flares. And so just to look at the uh, population of patients that withdrew, uh, what we can see is that the majority are Asian in uh, both groups. Um, and as expected with uh, Asian ethnicity, uh, the majority were uh, genotypes B or C. And you can see that um, they had a relatively low surface antigen levels, uh, but you can see only about 10% um, in the TDF group alone and a little over a quarter in the combination group uh, had uh, uh, surface antigen levels uh, below 100 at the time of withdrawal. So what happened? Well, the first thing is that over the uh, follow-up period, uh, surface antigen loss was infrequent. You can see it occurred only in four patients. And interestingly, although three of them did have an ALT flare, you can see that for the most part, in, uh, it was really quite delayed after the flare. So you can see that many weeks after the withdrawal flare uh, that they um, saw uh, surface antigen loss. So it wasn't sort of flare and then clearance. And if you look at what happened over time, you can see that the surface antigen decline was fairly modest. You can see that in the, the majority of patients, they had less than a half log decline after treatment withdrawal. And you can see that if you look at... Um, if we looked at this uh, by treatment group, there was no difference. And by baseline, the antigen status also did not differ. And this is perhaps the most important finding was that when you look at who was likely to have a greater surface antigen loss, it was interestingly not the patients with the flare. So the patients with um, without a grade three flare, so an ALT elevation that was less than five times the upper limit normal, you can see some of these patients had S antigen decline, whereas these patients that actually did have a flare, interestingly, had a very flat S antigen curves after this flare. So we saw a greater S decline in those without ALT flares, which is really, I think, counterintuitive to what might have been expected. And not only did they not have a surface antigen decline, but they went on to have a higher likelihood of active disease. So you can see that patients that had a flare were more likely to end up in this pink group or the green group of indeterminate and very unlikely to be active carriers, whereas patients that had no flare uh, had a lower probability of having active disease. And if you look at the factors associated with these ALT flares, interestingly, 
at baseline, uh, the, the uh, older age and a higher HPV DNA. So this is before going on antiviral therapy that they had, uh, these were predictive of subsequent flares after withdrawal. But at the end of treatment, surprisingly, no factors were predictive of significant ALT flares. Uh, the ALT at the, the end of treatment, the HPV DNA, and even the quantitative surface antigen level did not predict the likelihood of these flares. At the time that they had a flare, not surprisingly, they tended to have higher HPV DNA and quantitative surface antigen levels, but perhaps more importantly, at the visit prior to a flare, a DNA level was predictive of flare, and particularly if they got above four logs, you can see a very high odds ratio for a subsequent flare, making the case that if you see patients getting above this threshold, you might want to put them back on therapy to prevent this subsequent flare, because we really didn't see any benefit to these flares. So surface antigen loss or sustained inactive disease after nucleotide analog withdrawal is relatively infrequent. ALT flares are not required for surface antigen loss or decline, and I think this sort of questions the concept of the therapeutic or good flare, at least in the context of withdrawal. That might be different when we look at new uh, avenues for therapeutic approaches, but at least with treatment withdrawal, flares do not seem to be required, and if anything, may actually predict a future active disease. A high HPV DNA uh, predicts flare and might be a, tr a good trigger to restart therapy. And although I didn't show these data, patients with cirrhosis and those who were still antigen positive at the end of treatment, or even if they didn't develop anti-HB uh, e antibodies uh, were much uh, more likely to have severe outcomes and this should be generally avoided. So now let's move on to hepatitis B curative uh, therapies, which is the more exciting uh, area. And this is uh, intentionally a complicated picture of the HPV life cycle to remind us that this is not straightforward, but that there are a lot of potential areas to interfere with the life cycle and to uh, lead to HPV cure. So we can block entry, we can target CCC DNA either for destruction or inactivation. We can target the viral transcripts to prevent production of the viral antigens. We can prevent packaging. We can block DNA synthesis like we've done with our nukes for years, potentially block export or assembly of new viruses, or we can stimulate the innate or adaptive immune response. And I've in yellow highlighted uh, the areas that uh, I'll briefly uh, touch on today. So there are now what has been talked about for a long time is the idea of using combination therapy and generally people lump this to together as thinking about HPV DNA suppression either with a nuke or adding something to a nuke so a capsid assembly modulator to block encapsidation or um, RNA interference which will also block uh, replication. Then there's interest in trying to drive down antigen production, so protein depletion, either with uh, silencing RNA or antisense oligonucleotides, nu nucleic acid polymers, another approach, and then bringing in an immune target, either an innate immune agonist, like a toll-like receptor agonist, or working on the adaptive immunity side with either blocking um, the... Uh, checkpoint inhibitor blockade or a renewed interest in therapeutic vaccines. And of course, you can mix and match these combinations with lots of potential combinations. And one of the things that was exciting about this year's meeting was this is the first time we actually saw some combination data. So when uh, we, uh, one of the, the more interesting uh, abstracts at the meeting was the REEF-1 study, which combined an siRNA uh, with a capsid assembly modulator. And so this is uh, an siRNA which has been studied alone in a fair bit at different doses, um, uh, combined uh, with a CAM uh, that was given either alone or in combination with the siRNA. Patients were treated for 48 weeks and then had 24 weeks off follow-up if they met uh, stopping criteria. And um, the uh, patients had to be non-serotic, they could be nuke suppressed or naive and had to have a surface antigen level above 100 and uh, randomization was stratified by E antigen and by uh, treatment, whether they were on a nuke or not. And you can see here are the different arms and here are the number of patients that actually met the nucleotide analog stopping criteria. And to do that, they had to have an ALT less than three times the upper limit of normal, an undetectable HPV DNA, be E antigen negative and have a surface antigen level less than 10. So this was a bit surprising because what you see here is the combination therapy, the arm that we all held out as being the exciting arm here, had a lower 
response rate, both on treatment and then in the post-treatment follow-up in the, the, the shaded area here, compared to the same dose of siRNA uh, combined with the CAM, and you can see that the CAM alone uh, never achieved this nuke stopping rule. So this was a little bit surprising, and actually the highest dose of siRNA was the most effective approach. And if you look at this a little more carefully, you can see the surface antigen decline levels here by a treatment group and placebo in the different treatment arms. And then you can see the number of patients who got surface antigen levels below 100. And again, the CAM alone did not work so well. And the combination, again, did at least slightly less well uh, than the same dose of siRNA alone and considerably less well than the higher dose of siRNA. And if you look at the surface antigen decline, what you see is this initial rapid decline and then sort of a plateau after 24 weeks. We don't really understand this, but it's been uh, seen with multiple siRNA approaches and doesn't the combination doesn't seem to enhance this. A high proportion achieved surface antigen uh, level below 100, but no patients actually achieved functional cure or surface antigen loss in this study. And it's really unclear why this CAM had no effect on surface antigen either alone and almost seemed to have an inhibitory effect when combined with the siRNA. Why this is true and whether this would be true for all CAMs or if this next generation of more potent CAMs will be more promising is, is still unclear. There was another combination presented at the meeting of an siRNA again, but here combining it with an immune uh, modulator, our old friend PEG interferon. And so this was uh, the siRNA from VIR. Um, uh, and what they did here is either gave the siRNA alone or did a lead-in with the siRNA followed by interferon, which I think is the strategy that many of us would have thought was a good idea, bring down the antigen levels and then bring in an immune modulator or start the two together. Um, and, uh, and just the only difference here is that uh, the patients could continue PEG interferon if they didn't uh, get to um, uh, the surface antigen levels very uh, low uh, before at the end of therapy. And so what you see here is you can sort of see this in what they presented for the abstract that you can see that when these work, the siRNA was uh, given either alone or uh, was given as a lead in, these are really superimposable. And the only benefit was seen when you combine them from the beginning. So if you gave interferon um, combined with the, um, the siRNA from the start, you did get a little bit better S antigen decline. And that's evidently shown here with individual patient data. Um, but Overall, this lead-in really have, didn't have any a particular effect, which I think was a bit surprising and perhaps disappointing. So three patients did lose surface antigen, but all of them actually started uh, a, a, with a pretty low surface antigen level. And uh, most patients did get below 100 IU per ml, this sort of magic number that is associated with a good natural history. Um, but the combination was better, but really there was no advantage to lead-in. And it might make the argument that perhaps was predictable that antigen reduction is perhaps more important for reinitiating the adaptive immune response and less important for uh, reactivating the innate immune response. And this brings up the question of what about the adaptive immune response? And there's been a lot of excitement about um, checkpoint inhibitors in cancer therapy of PD-1 and PD-L1. And so this has been now evaluated in the HPV space. Could we reinvigorate these T cells? And here we saw some early data with an antibody against PD-L1, ligand for PD-1. And so this was given sub-Q every two weeks for 12 doses in non-serotic nuke suppressed patients uh, with a relatively low surface antigen level who were E antigen negative. And what you see here is that the, some patients did have surface antigen decline, and this was greatest, uh, the greatest log decline was seen in patients who started with a low level of surface antigen. And in fact, if you look at this group, uh, three out of the 16 cleared surface antigen and seven uh, out of this group um, had a, a greater than half log decline in S antigen, which is promising. So the, what this it was interesting as you did see some surface antigen loss, which is exciting, but these were all in patients who started with low S levels. They did have moderate ALT flares. It was relatively well tolerated. There were some injection site reactions and three patients developed thyroid disease, which was thought to be immune related. So this might be a promising thing to combine uh, with one of these antigen reducing strategies, siRNA or another one, and certainly more data are coming. So if we summarize what we saw from HPV cure, there was a lot more data at the meeting, but I really focused on data moving forward into at least phase two. This was the first meeting to show combination therapy data 
was a bit underwhelming that the siRNA in CAM was less effective than the siRNA alone. We really saw no boost to peg interferon activity with the lead-in of siRNA, but there's lots more um, agents in the pipeline, and there were more data shown at the meeting with CAMs, with siRNA, with antisense oligos, entry blockers, and others, and also a number of immunotherapeutic strategies, so lots more to come in this field. And now we'll finish in the last few minutes by talking about Delta, and it's no uh, surprise to this audience that we know this is the worst form of viral hepatitis, but actually has decreasing global prevalence partially because of hepatitis B vaccination and actually because of mortality from patients with co-infection, because this really uh, accounts for a significant proportion of patients, of uh, surface antigen positive patients with cirrhosis uh, and cancer, despite a relatively low prevalence uh, of among uh, surface antigen positive patients. So it's really overrepresented among all bad outcomes. And you can see that shown here uh, in this uh, recent paper, particularly among those with cirrhosis and HCC among surface antigen positive patients. If they have Delta, they tend to do worse. So it was exciting to have uh, bulavirtide, uh, previously called Mercludex B, which binds to the NTCP receptor and blocks surface antigen entry, which prevents uh, Delta from getting in as well. And there were some data shown from the French early access program that allowed this to be given to patients either alone um, daily for 12 months or in combination with weekly uh, interferon. And importantly, this was not randomized. Uh, so these are real world data. And what you see is they looked at the number of patients who had either got undetectable HDV RNA or a two log decline. And you can see that this was higher in the blue bar shown with the combination therapy than with bulavirtide alone, but not bad. Actually, two thirds of patients with uh, monotherapy at a low dose already had pretty um, had suppressed uh, HDV RNA. And you can see that in addition, even in some patients that didn't suppress virus, uh, ALT normalization occurred in a, in a high proportion of patients. AEs were common, but only two uh, patients with monotherapy and three with combination discontinued for an AE. And the only thing that I think we need to watch for is that bile acid did increase in everybody, which is expected, uh, but itch was not reported. So these are certainly promising early data in support of the combination of using interferon on with bulavirtide, and ALT normalization was seen even without the virologic effect. And another nice study of this uh, looked at a, a high versus low dose of bulavirtide, either two milligrams or 10 milligrams um, uh, sub Q. And here they were really focusing, although there is going to be clinical data of looking at the same HDB RNA decline and ALT normalization, they, the, the focus here, it was on liver biopsies. And what's interesting here is that you, they looked at intrahepatic HDB antigen or HDB RNA. And you can see that in both treatment groups, uh, you can see that they had a significant reduction in HDB antigen and RNA. And um, actually half of the patients in the higher dose group Group had undetectable HDV RNA after a year of therapy with paired liver biopsies, was, which is pretty exciting. So to summarize, bulavirtide is now approved alone or in combination with interferon. The early antiviral and biochemical data are promising, including liver biopsy data. Long-term safety and tolerability require further follow-up, but this may be very effective, particularly if combined with other surface antigen targeting strategies, either ones that are targeting for hep B, like siRNAs, antisense, or the NAPs or STOPs, uh, but also some HDV targeting therapies like lonafarnib, the prenylation inhibitor that's in phase two in now phase three studies. So to summarize, exciting area of therapeutic development for HPV and HDV. HPV cure is still a ways off, but so there's lots of exciting science and some promising new approaches. Until we get there, we're stuck with the nukes and nuke withdrawal is a questionable benefit. Stay tuned for the debate that's coming up. And clearly uh, some, we finally have some therapy for HDV, which is exciting and lots more to come. Thank you very much for your attention. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm very delighted to be part of the TASL AASLD uh, symposium. I'll be doing the HCV debrief. These are my disclosures. I'm going to start by reviewing the elimination updates. As you're aware, the WHO has set aggressive targets uh, for HCV elimination by 2030, looking to see a 90% reduction in new infections and a 65% reduction in HCV related mortality. So this study is looking um, at what have we achieved in the last five years in terms of global hepatitis elimination 
um, efforts. And that's sort of setting the stage then for uh, the next five years. So this is a study looking to evaluate national, regional, and global progress toward HCV elimination um, at the start of 2020. So really capturing what happened the last five years. They used a integrated literature review with Delphi process and modeling. They used epidemiological data that were collected from both published and unpublished sources. They validated those in collaboration with country experts. Um, collected uh, data that were then entered into a, count, a country level Markov modeling. Um, I'm going to show you the results. Uh, you can see that there's 110 countries that um, with models, 80 of which were approved by country experts. They found that the global prevalence of viremic HCV is estimated to be 0.75% at the start of 2020. This means we have 59 million viremic infections uh, still globally. That's a 0 .7 million, de million decline from 2015, so progress made. Um, interestingly, uh, 9.4 million have been treated in the 2015 to 2019 timeframe, of which one third were in uh, Egypt. What you can see in the map is that the prevalence remains highest in Eastern Europe and in Central Asia. Uh, most countries have prevalence um, rates that change less than 10%, uh, but the greatest drop was seen, as you can uh, see from the arrow, in Egypt that moved from a prevalence rate which was uh, greater than 2.8% uh, to now less than 0.6%. And further, they looked at um, really what else, what else was achieved. Um, I showed you the cured rate, but um, note that there were 7.4 million new infections that developed during this time frame, and we still had 5.5 million deaths, uh, 2015 to 2019. And when we look at the cascade of care, which is on the far right of the graphic, you can see that uh, we still have substantial strides that need to be made. Less than 25% of iremic infections have been diagnosed and less than 10% treated globally. So this is a helpful um, kind of reminder um, of where we're at. The global prevalence uh, has declined, but we still have a lot of iremic individuals. And this provides a jumping off point for us in terms of our continued effort towards HCV elimination. Uh, the second study related to the elimination agenda is looking at how COVID-19 impacted viral hepatitis. And here it's a survey that was done across 31 centers worldwide and in this survey, what they sought uh, was to evaluate how the pandemic has influenced um, elimination goals. So this was a, a prospective web-based survey, survey. It was delivered to active EASL members, uh, global viral hepatitis experts, and law, large clinical centers in Europe. And um, this was the data, av available data to May of 2021. And what they were looking at um, in terms of the comparison was pre-COVID in 2019 versus in the midst of COVID in 2020, and characterizing the total number of outpatient consultations for new referrals, uh, the number of patients starting treatment, and the number of tests performed for viral hepatitis. And shown here are the results, um, and I'm gonna focus on hepatitis C here. Um, you can see that of the 37 centers from five continents that responded, that there's a 45% reduction in new HCV consultations during this time, a much more modest reduction in HCV RNA testing. But shown on the right is the impact on treatment. Um, you can see the proportion of centers reporting reductions in treatment is quite significant. Uh, with 27% of centers reporting a greater than 75% reduction in treatment um, and 31% having a 50 to 70% reduction. So over 50% having a more than 50% reduction in their uh, new treatment initiations. So this confirms, I think, what all of us know um, in our own practices is that the pandemic has substantially impacted the care of patients with chronic viral hepatitis, both hepatitis C and B, with declines in testing, referrals, and most importantly, treatment. So we're gonna have some significant catch up to do in terms of, again, reaching our goals of elimination. Next, we'll cover test and treat strategies. The first is a community-based trial of ACV treatment in marginalized populations. The marginalized populations being those less likely to uh, access traditional healthcare settings. 
It's a single arm uh, study con conducted in an urban community center in the United States that targeted persons who are experiencing homelessness and currently injecting drugs. And what you can see in the figure on the right is they use the approach that they, on um, the first visit, they did a rapid test. And if they were antibody positive, they collected blood um, that then was tested for HCV RNA. On visit two, they returned for disclosure of those HCV RNA results. And if they were positive, they were offered a treatment immediately. Uh, they were given a starter pack of soft bell uh, for two weeks. And then those that had insurance, they uh, submitted um, treatment and PA for the soft bell. And if they were uninsured, they continued to assist with provision of uh, the therapy. And they were evaluated every two weeks until the end of treatment and SVR 12. So uh, this is a large study, 414 uh, participants, and they found 27% positive for the antibody and RNA. 66 returned for their diagnosis disclosure for that second visit and were eligible to be enrolled. And um, 73 of 75 of those eligible initiated treatments, so very high rates, of those that have uh, reached the point of completion, 84% have completed treatment, and the SVR rate is 96% in those uh, that have week 12 post results. Shown in the figures at the right, that you can see that um, the major drop off is in that return for the second visit to start treatment. But here, even um, we can say that they achieved a good result 66% returning, but then very high rates of initiating uh, treatment, as you can see with their. Uh, ability to start treatment on visit two. So they felt um, in this study that the provision of the treatment starter package improved treatment initiation and completion in this community setting. Uh, now there's a second study using a similar approach. This is the ST and RT trial. Again, focused on um, individuals that are more difficult in terms of accessing traditional treatment settings. Here they focused on young persons who inject drugs similar idea of how, how can we simplify and rapidly initiate treatment in these patient populations. So you can see that the, the target group here was 18 to 29 year olds who are anti-HCV positive treatment naive, but were using injection drugs within the past 30 days. And again, shown in the figure at the bottom is the study design is such that they identified those that were HCV RNA tested and found to be positive. And then they had a usual care arm where they you know, is as typical currently as, you know, they do testing, they refer the patient to an HCV provider, they have to connect with that provider, they have to get baseline testing, they have to get authorization, and then they start their drug. Whereas on the, um, the study arm where they provided the rapid treatment, you can see that they provided a seven day starter package to get the patient started on treatment, um, and then um, provided ongoing treatment for that patient, either via pickup or delivery. Um, in those individuals who had insurance, it was done through insurance, but otherwise provided through the study. Shown here are the results. You can see that the rapid treatment group uh, in green uh, was superior in terms of its ability to initiate and complete treatment compared to the usual care group in blue. It's a small number of patients, 14 in the rapid group, 11 in the usual care group, but I think impressive uh, results. Shown on the table at the right is the clinical outcomes in those that initiated DA therapy. You can see in the usual care group, very few initiated treatment, which is sort of the main finding of this study. But in the ST and RT group, uh, SVR rate was 69%, but you can see that failures were low with most of the lack of SVR due to individuals not returning for SVR testing. So they concluded that the higher cure rates could be achievable using this rapid treatment model, where they provided same day, low threshold, simplified HCV care, um, as opposed to the facilitated referral model, which is our usual. And that meeting young uh, persons who inject drugs where they're at and treating them without the need for repeat visits appears to be a promising strategy. And then I'm gonna conclude with one more study that focuses more on diagnostics. Um, here, the aim was to evaluate the feasibility and acceptability of HCV viral load point of care testing to improve screening and treatment. Here, there were 909 consecutive persons who inject drugs from five centers throughout Italy that were invited to participate. 
And what they did was ACBR testing using a finger stick capillary whole blood RNA test, which provided results in 60 minutes. What you can see in the figure on the right is 96% of patients agreed to be testing. Um, and of those that were tested, 20% found to be positive for HCV RNA. And you can see they were successfully linked for care, linked with care and treated. And in those that started treatment, which was 60% of those positive, 100% SVR rate. So they concluded that point of care testing is feasible and acceptable and favors uh, persons who inject drug engagement, increases HCV treatment, as evidenced by their findings of high completion rates. What these studies suggest is that the optimal test and treat model is as follows, that we would in one visit and with one provider test using a point of care test for HCV RNA or core antigen that would allow us to establish the diagnosis, that allows us to then educate the patient on this new diagnosis and initiate treatment using a pangenotypic regimen, all in one visit. That is ultimately the goal of new strategies uh, to achieve elimination. Now I'm going to move to, on to HCV and the patients with HCV, and we have two studies here. The first is uh, one of an ongoing prospective cohort called the Peter cohort. Here um, in this prospective cohort, they're now extending their initial observations to medium and long-term results. What they're interested in in this cohort is the risk of de novo HCC development after HCV eradication. Uh, the study population is consecutive DAA-treated patients with cirrhosis from 30 centers in Italy. To be included, the patients had to have cirrhosis with at least one year of follow-up after the end of DAA treatment with patients who underwent liver transplant or who had a prior diagnosis of HCC excluded. The overall results are shown here. Of 2,214 DAA-treated patients, 149 or 6.7% have developed HCC over a median uh, follow-up of 30 months. You can see that the rate of HCC is much higher in those without SVR. 150 patients have not had SVR, 20% in that group versus 5.8% in the group that achieved SVR. The overall incidence rate is 2.8% per person years. And interestingly, 80% of them were diagnosed with a pretty advanced um, BCL siege stage, um, BC in this uh, study. And when they looked at risk factors for HCC, um, not too many surprises shown on the right, older age and more advanced liver disease is reflected by low platelets or low albumin levels. But um, interestingly, genotype three emerged as a strong uh, and independent risk factor in this cohort. So what they concluded was that HCC insulin incidence and risk factors after DA therapy um, are similar to those from previous study, but confirmed in this prospective cohort. Um, the significant proportion diagnosed at advanced BCLC stage highlight the need for us to consider uh, further risk stratification um, and potentially new biomarkers, as well as potentially alternative surveillance strategies uh, for particularly high-risk patients with the view that we may be able to diagnose them earlier. This next study focuses on the uh, thresholds to potentially guide routine surveillance for HCC in patients with um, hepatitis C cirrhosis who've achieved SVR. So as you know, the ASLD recommends biannual surveillance uh, for HCC in any individual who has a, an incidence rate of greater than 1.5% per year. And I just showed you the study um, from Italy in which that um, incidence rate was 2.8%, which is certainly well above the current threshold of 1.5. But the question is how low would still be cost effective? So, and this is relevant because we do have a very large population of patients who um, have achieved SVR as shown in the figure in the middle. Um, and they have a lower competing risk of dying of, of liver disease. So, um, and we know their risk for HCC also has declined. So what is the threshold? So the aim here was to look at HCC incidence and see whether routine uh, surveillance was cost effective at a lower threshold. They developed a micro simulation model of natural history of HCC in patients with SVR. Uh, they accounted for competing uh, risks, uh, HCC tumor progression, HCC surveillance, adherence and treatment options, and then used a will updated willingness to pay threshold of 100,000 per quality adjusted life. Uh, years. The results are shown here. So first, uh, looking to the left, 
what you can see is that the um, incremental cost effectiveness ratio for the old incidence threshold of 1.5% is very cost effective at the current willingness to pay um, rate of 100,000. But you can also see that um, a new incidence threshold of 0.4% is also cost effective and well below that uh, prior sort of old threshold. And shown on the right is sensitivity analysis in which they modified the model inputs um, you know, to ensure that um, across varying uh, incidence uh, thresholds that the recommendation would hold a solid. And what they showed is that this new HCC incidence threshold remained lower than the current AASLD recommendations, regardless of how they model the uncertainty in their, in their predictions. And so what this tells us is that in our ACV patients with SVR, that HCC surveillance um, is certainly cost effective uh, if the incidence rate is 1.5% per year, but it's going to remain cost effective even at incidence rates as low as 0.4% per year. So that would suggest that there's going to be a large proportion, in fact, the majority of our patients, I think, with cirrhosis who will remain a group that will benefit from surveillance long term. And then my final uh, topic is treatment updates. And there was only one uh, study I wanted to review, and that's one looking at the use of sovospavir with glaclapivir, paprentisvir, and ribavirin for the retreatment of patients who had failed Sofelvox. So as you know, uh, most patients will be successful with their first course of DAA therapy, but a few percentage will fail. It's recommended that those patients typically are treated with Sofelvox. And then the question is of the small percentage that fail that second line therapy, what to do? And guidance documents recommend uh, consideration of soft GP and ribavirin for 16 to 24 weeks, but, but there were limited data in terms of the success of that recommendation. So this is an experience in which um, investigators from uh, Kaiser Permanente and UCSF looked at their experience with this approach, soft plus GP plus ribavirin for soft, soft valve box failures. Um, it's a modest number of patients, 12 overall, uh, median age 66. Um, you can see that they were uh, genotype 1A, 67% and 33% were genotype 3. 50% of the patients had weight-based ribavirin dosing. Um, there was no use of growth factors. There were no treatment discontinuation or AEs requiring hospitalizations. And the main message shown on the far right is that all of these patients achieved SVR with this approach, um, despite having variable uh, resistance-associated um, mutations and, a, and many of them a complex prior treatment history. So they concluded that soft valve ox uh, failures um, can be successfully treated with soft plus GP plus ribavirin for 16 to 24 weeks uh, without any safety concerns. So the main takeaways are as follows that the global prevalence of HCV has declined, but only 25% of viremic individuals have been identified thus far globally and 10% treated. And that the COVID pandemic has certainly impacted testing, referrals, and treatment. We have a lot of catch up to do. I showed you several test and treat models for care and community and addiction centers, and these appear feasible and highly effective at engaging persons who inject drugs or other marginalized populations. Risk of HCC persists after SVR. Keep in mind genotype 3 as a risk factor. Um, low platelets, albumin, and uh, they also showed lower, higher liver stiffness measurements uh, associated with higher risk. We have now modeling data that show us that um, surveillance is cost effective, even if uh, the risk of HCC is as low as 0.4% per year. And then finally, some real world data showing that soft plus GP plus ribavirin is effective in our soft valve box treatment failures. Thank you, and I'd like to acknowledge the following individuals uh, for providing some slides. Thank you. Hello again. Uh, many thanks to both speakers. They shared the most up-to-date information and hottest topics about viral hepatitis. 
We benefited greatly from their presentations. We will take the questions at the end of this session. Two cases will be now be presented uh, and five panelists will discuss uh, these cases. The first uh, presenter is Sevda Agayeva from Baku Medical Plaza. While she is presenting her case, all panelists may pause and voice their questions and comments. Dr. Sevda Agayeva. Good evening, dear colleagues. I'm very glad to be a part of uh, ASLD TASL um, joint meeting again. And um, today I would like to thank first thank my professor Ramazan Idilman for giving me the opportunity to share the uh, case report. Uh, my report will be today on the um, exacerbation of hepatitis B and Delta co-infection associated with um, COVID-19. I have no disclosures. My patient is 35-year-old old female with normal, she had normal first pregnancy and natural birth in 2007. She was diagnosed with hepatitis B infection during the second pregnancy in 2009. Um, her S antigen uh, level was pretty low and her E antigen was negative a, and HBE antibody was positive. At that time, her HBV DNA was around 260 copies per milliliter. At that point, she stated that there was normal ultrasound examination, normal liver tests. So she had um, a natural second birth and complicated. Um, however, her doctor never checked for um, anti-Delta, uh, HDV, she never checked for uh, hepatitis Delta infection until 2016 when I first um, seen this patient. So um, she was checked for anti-HDV and came back positive. Um, her uh, HDV RNA level was around 14,000 copies per, uh, per milliliter. Uh, ultrasound examination already has shown um, moderate splenomegaly, mild heterogeneity of the liver. We've performed fiber scan and came back as um, stage two fibrosis with 7.9 kilopascal. Um, her ALT is still, they were normal, but her, um, she had low platelets at that time. So um, she was 29 at that point. So she was very afraid of the side effects of um, interferon treatment and she refused it. Um, and we decided to follow up this patient to see how it goes. She was per periodically receiving um, orsos of desoxycholic acid. So through um, 2016 until 2020, her ALT and AST level were within the uh, normal range, fluctuating from um, to 20, uh, 30s and um, 20s and 30s. However, her um, thrombocytes remained low, um, also range from 73,000 to 94,000. But there wasn't a drastic change in the liver enzymes and or um, platelet drop um, over those years. Her um, body mass index were um, average 20.2 um, kilograms per uh, square meter. She didn't have any concomitant diseases. Uh, she, and we decided since she was interferon naive in 2019, uh, we have um, offered her to travel to Turkey and to try to get into the Lulnafarnib trial. However, before she decided um, to go, the lockdown started and she was unable to travel anywhere. And But she didn't still didn't want to... Um, Go, go on with the interferon. In February 2021, the patient uh, got infected with COVID-19, but um, she was treated at home. Her GP started her Clexan, paracetamol, vitamin D, selenium. Um, but because he didn't have um, controlled fever and remained very high, on the first day of the disease, her doctor prescribed her favipiravir, and she was been taking this medication for 10 days at the, at the given dosage. And she was, uh, her liver enzyme tests were checked at the end of each week. So um, she uh, stated that her ALT and AST level increased um, and um, platelets were also lower than usual. 
Uh, we still don't know was it, if it was a possible drug-induced hepatic injury, was it COVID-19 related elevation of liver enzymes, or was it the viral flare? So her GP started her HEPA meds twice, twice a day, six, six grams a day, and also the acid, 500 milligrams, 500 milligrams um, daily for two weeks. I have seen this patient after the recovery in May, September, and December of 2021. However, her liver enzymes were not within the normal age, range anymore. So it was um, elevated. And um, at this point, um, we was started to thinking about the treatment. Also, her um, HDV RNA and, um, was pretty stable over the oldest years um, and in 2021, in September, when she was checking it the last time, it was increased by one log. However, DNA levels remained pretty much the same. So um, what came, we would perform ultrasound examination and um, a fiber scan. Uh, so, and we stated that though she had F2, um, two, stage two fibrosis over all those years, this is the first time when she um, developed uh, fibrosis stage three, so um, my question would be, what would be the best option for treatment strategy uh, to convince her to start interferon therapy, to start a viable in Russia Merclutex, or to wait for um, more, more um, drugs that will be released in the future, such as interferon lambda and lunafarni, or anything else? Thank you very much. And I would like to um, get the opinion of my professors and mentors. Thank you. I would like to thank the organizers of the meeting for giving me this opportunity. I'm Genco Gençtal, Koç University School of Medicine, Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, Istanbul, Turkey. I have no disclosures. A 45 years old male patient recently developed Menekova superior syndrome due to no mediastinal astenal fibrosis, received immunosuppressive therapy, rituximab, and mycophenolate. He was scheduled for surgery, cardiovascular surgery, due to the Menekova superior syndrome at the end of the month. COVID PCR was found positive 15 December. He was hospitalized due to increase in the oxygen demand, transferred to intensive care unit 25, 25 uh, December, followed up with non invasive mechanic ventilation support, taking hydrochloroquine and cortisone. Evaluated by internal medicine specialist, intravenous immunoglobulin, 19 grams was started. Here we are the admission levels, admission laboratory parameters uh, of the patient. Uh, ferritin D-dimer, interleukin-6, TRP, fibrinogen were higher, the others were normal. The patient was transferred to intensive care of our hospital, intubated. You see here the respiratory values and also oxygen saturation by 88. And a Kinra, Kinra interleukin antagonist was started. The court was started. Noradrenaline was started because of hypotension at 28 December. This slide shows a short summary of the uh, short summary of the uh, patient uh, course uh, and clinic course. COVID diagnosis 15 and then respiratory problems and then intubated uh, prone position, kinetic infusion, some treatments. Uh, added to his treatment treatment management, and then uh, because of hypotension, we started noradrenaline in our intern intensive care unit. Fever continued. Inflammation parameters increased. Rheumatology, cardiology consultations were performed. Actemra, tocilizumab, a monoclonal antibody against the interleukin six receptor was started. Extracorporeal membrane oxygenation was initiated. Jaundice has developed, liver function tests, bilirubins were increased, viral and autoimmune hepatitis tests were requested, and acetylcysteine and also deoxycholic acids were added. The, the AST ALT levels and ALP GGT levels were increased day by day since admission. And also total and direct bilirubin increased day by day uh, since the admission of the patient to the, our hospital. And uh, radiologic images showed that axial and coronal T2 weight image, MRCP sequence, axial tomography section showed that narrowed and dilated segments in the intra and hepatic pile ducts, hypodense, millimetric, hypodense, millimetric lesions, cholangitis, pericholangitic abscess were observed in the periportal areas, more prominently in the left lobe. Liver biopsy, liver biopsy was performed, enlargement of portal areas marked ductural proliferation, mixed inflammation with neutrophils are seen. Neutrophilic cholangitis, ductural ozonophilic secretion condensed bile, 
No plasma filling infiltration, immune globulin G3 negative, uh, diffuse cholangiopathy findings in the dark nucleus loss in epithelium, plasmic vascularization, ozonophilia. Bilymphs are seen in this picture, lobular cholestasis, portal peripotal fibro fibrosis. Biliary damage cholangiopathy are in the foreground in the biopsy, and biliary obstruction like injury is observed. In this stage, we, uh, we have done some meetings with multidisciplinary teams to uh, investigate the other uh, causes of uh, these findings. Uh, for example, drugs, hypotension, impaired microcirculation, vascular problems, sepsis. At the end of discussions, all discussions, uh, we decided to treat the patient as COVID cholangiopathy. The patient remained in the intensive care unit for a long time. Many, many complications occurred, received intensive care su supportive treatment. Then he was transferred to service. He was discharged about one month later. He is currently being followed from the outpatient clinic with normal liver function tests. Approximately two thirds of the patients with severe COVID-18 COVID, uh, COVID, uh, infection have elevated serum levels, have elevated AST and ALT, ALT levels, approximately 400 mean. In rare cases, liver damage may progress to liver ischemia. And although the etiology of acute liver injury in COVID-19 patients is unknown, it's thought to be multifactorial. Some studies have reported that the uh, degree of elevation of uh, transaminases is an indicator of uh, disease severity and independent predictor of mortality. Here is a very good slide uh, about the pathophysiology for liver injury um, for COVID-19 associated hepatocellular damage. Uh, this damage is mainly characterized by moderate statosis, uh, lobular portal inflammation, apoptic necrotic foci, and elevation of plasma, uh, ALT, and AST uh, levels. Uh, some uh, preliminary observations suggest that the injury might be caused by uh, cytopathic uh, hepatocellular infection effects, uh, which could induce mitochondrial dust dysfunction, endoplasmic reticulum stress, maybe mTOR, autophagy, viral escape. And uh, some uh, mechanisms uh, about that, uh, in addition, cytokine storm, cytokine storm, and uh, this uh, also uh, characterized by bile duct uh, proliferation, occasionally a bile uh, plaques, inflammation in portal tract, elevated plasma GGT and ALP levels. Also, hypoxia, drug-induced liver injury, drug-induced liver injury, endothelitis coagulopathy also causes the cell death. Maybe these patients with COVID infection may be divided to into three groups that patients without liver disease, with early stage of liver disease, and third group is patients with advanced liver disease. And some studies show that this uh, maybe uh, the prognosis of the uh, patients uh, due to stage of the uh, liver disease. For example, uh, su such as uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease associated metabolic comorbidity uh, would be uh, severe outcomes with COVID-19 infection. Some studies, according to some studies, unusual secondary sclerosing cholangitis, a picture seen in uh, critically Ill, Ill patient has been recognized uh, as a new complication of COVID-19 uh, uh, COVID infection. And this uh, article is from uh, American Journal of Gastroenterology uh, last year. It's published. Uh, they described clinical course and histological features of three adults who developed prolonged and severe cholestasis during recovery from critical cardiopulmonary COVID infection. And also, uh, that uh, they show liver enzymes, clinical course, 
and also histopathologic examinations, radiologic image, and uh, has recently been named as post-COVID cholangiopathy. It is characterized by persistent macrolestasis that persists long after pulmonary and renal recovery. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Sevda. Thank you again, Joe. Uh, the cases are very up to date. Uh, did you uh, make any correspondence to selected cases? Both of them are related to COVID-19. Again, Joe, Sevda. Hmm? Thank you, Sevda. Thank you again, Joe. Uh, you told before the, the cases are very up to date. presentations, but uh, not detailed the uh, speech. Actually, it, it would be better to uh, separate the cases, uh, but uh, the presentations are going to uh, subsequently. Uh, let's go back to the first uh, case, the Zerdas case. Uh, a Delta uh, hepatitis, uh, I think that patient had cirrhosis, Zerdas? Yes. Related to Delta? Mm -hmm. F3 fibrosis. Do you think that the COVID uh, changed his uh, progress? Uh, well, because she was, yes, because she was uh, treated by favipiravir, and there is some data that it, the, the medication itself can um, uh, increase the liver enzymes. Um, I, I'm not sure, and um, COVID itself, uh, separate from the medications, can also tackle the elevation of liver enzymes. That's why um, I'm not sure if COVID-19 had um, influenced the viral load to um, um, provoke um, increase in the viral rep replication because the patient was unable to check her um, uh, DNA and RNA, RNA level at that time. So we don't know how bad it was at the in, in, during the course of the disease. But um, I've seen the patient after that, and um, I don't think that um, the waiting, following up is a good option anymore because she had a one log elevation of um, RNA um, level and now her liver enzymes are not that stable anymore. So I think now is the time for treatment. And um, also it can be related to some patients with chronic hepatitis B that we see um, uh, that get worse um, tests after the COVID-19. So um, um, I think many doctors, many hepatologists would be interested uh, on how to follow the patient that are um, making it worse after following the um, COVID, um, COVID infection. That's why I was asking the um, mm -hmm. uh, opinion of the um, peers, of the mentors, and um, to see what they think about this. Yonajam, you are known as a uh, data man. <clears throat> Do you have any comment about this patient? Okay, I'm going to talk as the Delta Force. Uh, <laughs> but before going into Delta, I want to say a few words about hepatitis B. Now, there was a meta-analysis published in a journal. I don't remember which one, but there were even cases of ACLF after COVID-19, acute and chronic liver failure cases and mortalities due to hepatitis B. But in all these cases, None of them had been treated with nucleoside analogs. So they did not receive treatment for hepatitis B. And I think that is the very important point which we have to underline. Delta is similar to COVID-19, at least until recently COVID-19, a disease where there is no effective treatment. There is no antiviral treatment for Delta. There was, or let's say, put it this way, there was no antiviral treatment for Delta 
and there was also no antiviral treatment for COVID-19. We hear now that we have, after remdesivir, new treatments as well, molnupiravir and I think Paxlovid. I don't know, molnupiravir has been approved by the FDA and the next may also be get, get approval. But what I want to say is Delta is a serious concern because we don't have effective treatment. And we also have seen cases of Delta reactivation during COVID-19. Not all patients, of, of course, reactivate, but there are cases which reactivate. And if the patient is, is, has advanced cirrhosis, he risks the mortality or the patient, he or she risks mortality. So it is very important that these patients receive proper treatment. But unfortunately, there is no proper treatment for HTB so far. Uh, Bolivertide is approved in the European Union, uh, but it's not available in many countries. It's a, even in Europe, it's only available in France, Germany, Austria, and I think in Italy, that's all. In the US, there is no approval for, I mean, there is, they, have re, they are seeking for approval by the FDA, but so far, approval has not been granted as far as I know. Sorry? No, no. Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, this, is, this is the problem with Delta. But once you have this reactivation, and this, I think, was due to, the, it was not drug-induced uh, liver injury. It was uh, COVID-19-induced uh, liver enzyme elevation, the reactivation of HDV due to the cytokine storm. And this has to be treated now. If possible, the best way would be to let the patient go to Russia and get Boulevard type, if that's possible, but even that is possible. not easy it is. Yes. because it's not a cheap drug as well. Yeah, right. Interferon would I would not consider interferon treatment. Okay, uh, Nora, uh, do you have any comment about the first uh, <laughs> case? Well, I, I noticed that you also mentioned that the patient has cirrhosis, and I would also suspect, despite the fiber scan results, that she actually has been cirrhotic for some time since she has splenomegaly and thrombocytopenia. Either she has another cause for splenomegaly or she has more advanced fibrosis than what the fiber scan is showing you. Um, so that would make me really much more, even though she, she's young and she has really advanced disease. So I'd be very uh, eager to try to find her a treatment option. Um, but I agree that interferon would not be a drug that I'd be enthusiastic about. Again, um, just because of its efficacy, its tolerability, she's not enthusiastic. And then she also has more advanced disease. Right. So I'd be trying to impress on her that she has, you know, um, advanced disease, she's young, she really needs to seek treatment and um, encourage her to potentially look at, you know, if she can get access to drugs through whether Russia or another place is going to be a way to get them access through a clinical trial, but to be very proactive about it, because I am pretty concerned that she has m more advanced disease than what your fiber scan is showing you. Right. But, um, is yes, anybody uh, has any experience with bolivertide? Yeah, uh, I want to ask a question to Sevda. Yes. Uh, what do you think about this patient, about the uh, mild elevation of liver functional tests due to certain medications as frequently observed in the COVID-19 patients? Or uh, <clears throat> due, the, due to the course of the uh, especially to the viral effect of COVID-19 or due to the uh, co-infection of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 and HPV. Uh, because we know that uh, there is no increased risk of HPV reactivation in the course of uh, uh, COVID disease. Uh, so uh, the co-infection uh, has a slightly affect uh, uh, the ALT uh, levels. Uh, what do you think about these patients? COVID, the effect um, of the virus or medications or the co-infection? 
because uh, we couldn't um, we, because we couldn't check the, her um, DNA and RNA, it is hard to say. And of course, if she wouldn't be taking um, medications that could be possibly toxic for the liver, I would also consider it to be a viral flare. But she did use the medication. So at, that, at this point, I honestly am not sure on what it is. Actually, her um, progression of her fibrosis can be also related to the natural course of HDV and HPV co-infection, because at some point it would come to the point where it could be F5, F3 with um, worsening of um, liver enzymes. But um, so far, I still um, believe that it was all um, tackled by the virus, the COVID-19 virus. I, I believe it is so, because before that, she was pretty much stable. Okay, thank you. Actually, we have, we have seen several cases with uh, elevated ALT uh, due to COVID-19 uh, without any hepatitis B or hepatitis delta. Absolutely. Uh, we, we can discuss these uh, infections separately, I think. Yes, can I just uh, can I ask a question? Just of really, I'm interested in in um, my colleagues as well. Our approach, really, in somebody who has Delta, is usually to also have them on um, HBV therapy <laughs> most of the time, like to suppress their HBV DNA to undetectable levels, to sort of eliminate HBV as a contributing factor to their disease progression. So I was, you know, I know her HBV DNA levels are low, um, oh. lowish, higher now, but I'm just curious as to the practice of whether, you know, we have safe drugs and effective drugs to treat Hep B. Is there a role for putting her on treatment to suppress HBV, to take it out of the equation, make sure it's not a contributing factor to her disease progression? That would be our, my approach in my clinic as she would all, be on HBV therapy. Okay. Yes, that's a good option. We actually um, consider that as well. But because we were stuck with Delta first, to um, she didn't want to take any treatment before we dis, um, detect what to do with the um, Delta cofactor. But I think, yes, thank you very much. That's a very good option that we also consider. Thank you. But sometimes if we suppress hepatitis B virus, the Delta can reactivate. Uh, because of HPV uh, and Delta suppress each other. And if you suppress one of them, sometimes uh, Delta with interferon and sometimes hepatitis B with nucleoside mycotide unlocks, the other vi virus mm. can activate. So, so the, the general approach is not to treat the hep B. I, I'm just, I, I, you clearly have a lot more experience treating Delta than many of us do in, <laughs> in North America. So I really, I think we could learn from this experience because our approach would be to, to generally treat the, the virus we have a treatment for. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, in Turkey, there is another thing, and that's the insurance body. The in you get treatment for free, 100% is reimbursed by the insurance body. The insurance body is a state insurance. And according to the rules of the insurance system, if you have Delta hepatitis and have want to get nucleosidinol treatment, you have to have an HPV DNA level, which is about 2,000 international units per ml, uh, okay. plus an ALT more than two times the upper limit of normal. Uh, Meet HPV okay. treatment criteria. Yeah. Okay. So it's not that easy to get uh, right. straight away hepatitis HPV therapy. Now, um, does it help? <laughs> it may help on the long term. Yeah. Not if you start mm -hmm. three months ago or so, but if, right. if the patient is on treatment for with nucleus and unlock, for, let's say for two or three years, that might, might have an effect. And that may be actually because nucleus analog treatment, you, we know from the hepatitis B literature that it causes a slight decrease in surface antigen levels. Okay. Because, I mean, what the Delta the virus needs in terms of hepatitis from hepatitis B is the surface antigen production. So unless you can decrease surface antigen, 
uh, it's unlikely that you get a beneficial effect. I mean, thinking of uh, from a medical rationale. Right. It's yeah, let, let, let's think uh, COVID-19 separately. Jordan, uh, have you seen any patients uh, with uh, any acute liver failure due to COVID-19? Um, we haven't seen any patients with acute liver failure. We've actually seen a few patients that were more like the second case with this post-COVID cholangiopathy. Um, I must admit our outcomes have not unfortunately been as good as yours. So we've seen patients that did not get better after having this prolonged hospitalization and ended up with the cholangiopathy. And I'm surprised to hear that after that fairly impressive looking biopsy and uh, MRCP that that patient now has normal liver tests. Our, our experience is that these patients have ended up with fairly protracted, long-standing um, but uh, it's a very limited experience. We've seen a few cases and obviously we're probably seeing a bit of a referral bias. Um, and I, I haven't seen personally any cases of acute liver failure. We've seen some described in the literature of um, very high replication of the virus, probably actually within cholangiocytes more than hepatocytes. Um, and at least a few case reports of very severe acute hepatitis and occasionally acute liver failure challenging. One, one thing I thought I would, would ask you about is whether with um, one thing that we've noticed is that with using dexamethasone broadly for treatment of COVID-19, we've actually identified a lot of hep B patients because we have made sure that there's very good screening yeah. for hepatitis B surface antigen prior to starting. Um, and I was wondering if that's routine uh, in Turkey to screen patients prior to getting dexamethasone. Yes, it, it's routinely screened in all patients. Good. Good to hear. Actually, we uh, never seen any uh, COVID-19 cholangiopathy, and we have uh, no comment about the second uh, case. Uh, is there any comment about the second case? Yes. I actually told them we are experts in viral hepatitis. We don't know anything about COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Can that? Uh, Gedro, I want to ask a question to you. Now, now you know, we know that uh, ACE2 expression uh, is, in, uh, is very high, highly seen in the COVID-19 patients. And also, our uh, ACE2 expression is, more, uh, is, uh, is seen higher than the hepatocytes. So, uh, do you think that this has an effect on your patient scores? angiotensin converting converting enzyme uh, and uh, two expressions thank you for this nice question uh, the virus uses s protein uh, to enter the cell uh, but two receptors uses first ace2 ace2 is higher in uh, cholangiocytes but uh, transmembrane cell protease 2 is the second receptor to enter the cell and it's higher in hepatocytes. Uh, so uh, it's a very complex uh, infection. Maybe we, are, we see the, uh, the post-COVID cholangiopathy after, uh, long after pulmonary and renal recovery. Uh, so uh, this is really uh, a very difficult picture and difficult diagnosis. Uh, we call the diagnosis after discussions uh, with multidisciplinary uh, team. Uh, now, there are a few uh, case reports, but the etiology or uh, mechanisms are not clear. Uh, but drug-induced liver injury and hypoxia and long-standing hospitalization, the, the other factors, of course, uh, affects the uh, etiology. Yes, thank you. Uh, so the high-dose steroids, corticosteroids, and also more strong immunosuppressive therapy uh, may be an option uh, for this protracted course of disease of post-COVID-19 cholangiopathy, because sometimes these patients may need to make the liver transplantation. Thank you for this good, uh, very nice uh, case, Gajan. Thank you very much. Yes, there's a, a case report that uh, 
e, liver transplan- transplantation performed in the medical literature. I read it. It's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, we have a few minutes. Uh, uh, some questions are uh, directly to the speakers uh, about their talks. For example, Ramadan Idilman asks to Nora, can you share your experience with us on how to progress in terms of HCV elimination among IV drug users? Uh, what's your policy about uh, HCV elimination in uh, drug, IV drug users? Well, I think the best models are ones in which uh, I, as a hepatologist, pa- partner with those that are managing the uh, Uh, drug use disorder. So whether it's providers that treat uh, using uh, opiate substitution therapy or clinics that are focused on that group of individuals, I think there's a very good opportunity to partner there to provide them with the expertise and support for them to do HCV treatment in the context of also treating the individual who has um, a drug, you know, the drug use disorder. Um, we also have a lot of primary care providers that do treatment of individuals who are struggling with uh, drug use. And I think the mes- message that we give to them is that if they can establish a, a relationship with that patient such that they're willing to come back and, and or they're able to see those individuals on a regular basis, that those are individuals that also should be considered for treatment. We certainly don't require our patients to be drug-free before they start treatment. We really are sort of trying to meet them where they're at and and deliver treatment to them in that space. We just want to be able to be in a position that they will be able to take the drug and to complete the course. Uh, But mostly we're trying to go to where they are, whether it's in clinics that do treatment of um, uh, drug use disorder or partnering with primary care physicians who are caring for those patients and where they have established relationships. And they also are sort of treating those individuals in their primary care clinics. It's very rare. In fact, I can't remember the last time I've seen a patient in my specialty clinic um, because really I'm not a specialist in treating their uh, drug use disorder. And they really need to have both of those things treated simultaneously to have the best outcome. Okay, thank you. There is an interesting question from Vlad Dertikin. Have the panelists seen any COVID vaccine induced liver side effects, uh, including autoimmune hepatitis or autoimmune hepatitis flares? We've seen a few cases of liver enzyme elevation not long after vaccination. Proven cause and effect, of course, is challenging. There have been a few reports of triggering autoimmune hepatitis or flares of autoimmune hepatitis in the literature. Um, I must admit, we've tried not to emphasize them very much because they seem to be quite infrequent. And um, to be honest, we worry more about the, the, the fear of patients getting vaccinated because of these concerns than of the actual true medical concern of this, at least, uh, I I don't know, I'd be interested to hear if others have seen it more frequently, but we've certainly seen it uh, very infrequently. And I I don't think it's a major problem. But with anything, it's not, it probably can happen. It's just an infrequent, uh, infrequent finding. Actually, all uh, the patients uh, relate their complaints to the uh, vaccination. <laughs> Vaccine, that's right. <laughs> yeah, and it's very hard to prove the, the the timing, but it's not not unreasonable to think that. Um, I mean, we, that's been reported with other vaccinations that you can have flares of autoimmune hepatitis or triggering of it. So it's not impossible to think that there's a connection. But I think when you consider the millions of people, well, yeah. I mean, hundreds of millions of people that have been vaccinated, the frequency of it is quite low. Yeah, right. I mean, because of the rumor that uh, hepatitis B vaccination causes multiple sclerosis. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. In France, there was, uh, it, it, they were the, among the lowest uh, vaccination Gathers in 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 the in on a global scale. Can I ask you as well a question? Have you so, some experience with monopiravir? Is it really mm. going to change the paradigm of treatment in COVID nineteen? 
we, we did some of the studies with molybdenum. I don't know, Nora, if you've also had experience with it. We were doing some of the studies at our center. I mean, I, 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 I must admit, I would say my enthusiasm is a bit tempered for molybdenum. The, uh, the, the, the data are not overwhelming about its effect. And at least um, there is some concern about toxicity with the drug. It seemed safe in the trials, um, but the drug does probably at least partially bind to the, the gamma DNA polymerase in mitochondria. So there's a concern if it's given for longer than the this recommended short course for COVID-19 that there might be some toxicity. That was not seen in the trials, but it's been uh, reported previously that this drug does does potential potentially cause mitochondrial toxicity. So I'm I, I guess my feeling would be the people who need it, I would be a bit nervous about giving it to them. And the benefit seems fairly modest um, w- with it, with a, a bit of a lower reduction in clinical benefit af- in the final trial than was with the initial report. But this is, this is a very important thing you are saying, because uh, with fialuridine, before lamivudine, there was fialuridine. And right. <laughs> it was tested, but short term, and after three months, the uh, micro- mitochondrial toxicity problem emerged very heavily, and it was a disaster. The first study was a disaster. It's important to remember, though, that for COVID-19, at least, the intention is to give it for a very short term. So I, I don't think I'd want to give someone molupinavir as chronic antiviral therapy, but uh, I think as a short course therapy, certainly in the trial, as the data were reported, they didn't see a concern that this was uh, related to concerns about in vitro studies and animal studies that it might be toxic mm-hmm. with longer exposure. Okay. Do no. we have any experience? Uh, do we have any experience about the uh, uh, beneficial effects of oral antivirals such as tenofovir or entecavir on the course of the COVID nineteen? Probably not. Huh? <laughs> No, I mean, there were some early studies suggesting some some benefit of, um, there were also some studies looking at cefospivir and decladosphere, um, and, and some in vitro data suggesting they may impact the polymerase, but I think uh, the, the larger clinical trials didn't really bear those out, so I, I and, and I and some of the epidemiological data from particularly from Asia, looking at hepatitis B patients on and off therapy with no difference in the incidence or outcome would, I think, argue against the, the benefit of, of those drugs for, for COVID-19. But that's speculative at best. <laughs> okay, the time is over. Actually, uh, I would thank to all the speakers and the case presenters and all the panelists. Thank you very much for the, your contribution. Uh, on behalf of Tazel and ASLD, I thank you all of you. Right. Hope to see you again face to face in Turkey and Istanbul. <laughs> that would be much nicer than on Zoom. But thanks yes, for I agree. <laughs> all the best. Bye.